Hello, 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 and thanks for being here with us again on uh, another episode here on the Shine on Arapaho Productions podcast. I am here today with Carrie Whitlow, our Executive Director of the uh, Department of Education here at the Shine on Arapaho Tribes. And before I forget, my name is Darren Brown, Senior Content Producer here at Shine on Arapaho Productions. But we've been trying to get Carrie in here for a long time, and I know you, you know, you're an executive director. <laughs> That's a big deal. So you, I know you're busy. Uh, so thank you so much for carving out the time. Uh, Carrie, tell us about yourself. Where are you, where are you from? How'd you get here? Okay. Well, I just want to share that I am equally as excited to be here because I do love podcasts. I know Hawk has been talking about doing podcasts for a while now. Hawk Hardico, our yes. uh, content producer over here. <laughs> Um, so I love podcasts. I love, I subscribe to a number. I mean, so many, and I just listen daily, weekly. I love podcasts, so I'm just very excited. And now to be you here. are a part. I know. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, so my name is Carrie Whitlow. My Arapaho name is Nanaka A. Hisse. My nickname is KK. Um, my formal legal name is Carrie Whitlow, but a lot of people know me as KK Franklin. Um, that was a nickname that was given to me by my brother at a young age. Uh, my mother's maiden name uh, is Franklin. So when I used to go to powwows a lot, I would use the name KK Franklin, Carrie Whitlow. That's the same person. A lot of people still don't know that to this day. Yesterday, someone, I was at a meeting and they said, I never knew your real name was Carrie <laughs> Whitlow. I just know, known you as KK. So um, I'm from El Reno, Oklahoma. I'm Sean Arapaho, Kaiwan Creek. I have worked for the Shine Arapaho Tribes for the past 17 years in various leadership and management capacities. So I've been here at the Department of Education since 2015, September 2015. So it's gone by really fast. And it has. Yes. We are so, so glad fast. to have you. Absolutely. Yes. So, um, you know, our positions are nominated. You have to be confirmed by the legislators. You have to be nominated from the administration. So... Uh, my job isn't always guaranteed, uh, depending on the administration, but I'm thankful to have lasted for eight years and been here this long. So thank you for having me. Yeah, and tell us, what, what were your, in what capacity did you work for the tribes before you came to the, this department? Okay, so I worked for, my first real permanent job was for the RESPECT program, and that was a year after I graduated uh, high school in 2005. So 2006, I finally found permanent employment here at the tribes. And I worked for the RESPECT program from 2006 till almost 2013. Oh, okay. I think 2014, I started working for the Department of Enrollment as their executive director, and then I transferred over here. So I was a coordinator at RESPECT. Eventually, I became the director, I think, the last three to four years that I was there. So that's where I spent a majority of my time for the RESPECT program. So I know that uh, you followed... Uh uh, Teresa Dorsett here yes. at the uh, at the Department of Education, and I guess Quentin Romano's yeah. for her. So uh, you guys have had some big shoes uh, yes. all the way back to step into. Uh, I'm sh- I would bet that uh, I know if it were me, I came in here, I uh, would be like, well, now like, there's a, there's a, you you get that you get come in here, but there's so much stuff. How many, we have a lot of programs, and you got to learn uh, not just a little, but you've got to learn about every one of them and what they do. Yes. Even though people may think they know what those mm-hmm. programs do, you really have to know. Yes, exactly. So I do want to say Quentin and Teresa both were mentors of mine. Um, obviously, being a tribal citizen, I, you know, throughout the years have utilized JON program. Most importantly, higher education uh, funded me all the way to the where I'm at this point in my life. Um, so I've always known Quentin. I've always known Teresa. And, you know, if it wasn't for them and the opportunities that they provided me as a middle middle school student, a high school student, whether that's filling out the financial aid, um, going on college tours, going to basketball tournaments, um, you know, I I don't think I would be the definitely the leader educator that I am today. Um, Like you said, those are big shoes to fill. So those were mentors for a long time. I knew them as a participant of the education department for many years, never thought I would be in this space. And I'm just thankful that now to call those two people um, colleagues and I get to work with them in a different capacity now. And so it's just very much a privilege whenever you learn about who they are and what they've been doing for years for Indian education. So definitely grateful to be part of that um, 
legacy to continue <laughs> Exactly, it. yeah. Yes. You know, I was talking with the, the folks from our higher education department uh, not long ago, and I, I, we think we didn't know the answer, but, I, you know, I, I, we talk about, oh, you know, they were here so long ago, and, but it, really, before gaming— there was no education department. No. I mean, th- there was, I mean, the, 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 the structure that we had, the infrastructure we have now, and we think that, we always think, that, oh, we got to go to, and we got to do this. Yeah, but, to, I mean, let's be, it's it's difficult to think of where we are now and how far it's come in, in a very short time. Yes, correct. Uh, a lot of that has to do with people like Teresa and people like Quentin, um, as far as them having a vision them understanding how this department operates and how, you know, basically what I'm doing is just continuing to build capacity of what they've started um, just to continue um, to offer more services, um, apply for more grants, um, and really just provide opportunities for our families and students. Build capacity. That's a really good way of saying that. Yes. It just, it just, it says that those two words that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me let me ask you this. So, we, could you just give give us like, man, I, I can't say brief, but just give us an overview of the department. Okay, so let me just say this. So, whenever, and I don't know if every tribe is the same way, but coming into this position, there's no guidebook, there's no succession <laughs> plan as far to say um, this is exactly what you need to what you need to do, what you need to know. Um, I will say that I am very fortunate because of Quentin. Um, He is the executive director of the Tribal Education Department's National Assembly, and that's TEDNA. So this organization started, I think this year they celebrated 20 years. And so I was very fortunate that 2015, I started in September 2015. Um, The next month was NIEA in, I want to say, Portland. And, you know, knowing Quentin, he's like, hey, you need to come to this meeting at NIEA. So I attended the meeting, had no idea what TENDA was, had no idea what tribal education departments were um, or how they function, what role that they played. So I went, I attended, and this is a national organization of TED directors coming together to say, this is what's important to us. Um, This is how you build capacity. This is how you network, how you connect with people to help you do so. And really the only reason that uh, you know, I've had any type of progress, made progress or had any type of success is because of that organization. So I sit on the board. Um, I'm on the executive committee. And you really learn a lot from other tribes and other people as far as what they're doing. And that gives you, Tedna gives you the access to that network. And so because That's of... That's valuable, I'm yes, sure. And so even here in Oklahoma, I mean, having close friendships with... The Creek Nation, um, Absentee Shawnee, Citizen Potawatomi, Wichita, Kiowa, Comanche, and to be able to know these people in these positions and you can text them and say, hey, how did you do this? Yeah, it's one thing to know someone, yes. but to be able to call them. Yes, to be able to call them, email them, hey, yeah. I need your help on this. How do I understand this? I mean, invaluable people that are on the ground doing the same thing and in the same position that I, I wouldn't even know where I would be without that network. Um, and then what else did you ask? Oh, I, I, well, I asked for an overview. Oh, yes. <laughs> like let's say, let's say someone who doesn't know exactly, they don't know much about this tribe. Okay. What do you say about the Department of Education? So a tri- we are a tribal education department. Tribal education departments, their role is to educate. No, is to, let me say that again. So tribal education departments, their role is to support the education of their tribal citizens. So how we do that, the Shiner Apo tribes, we put a large emphasis on services and how we get those services into the hands of our people, whether that's scholarship money, ACT fees, backpacks, supplies, how are we getting that into the hands of our people? So, of course, we wanted to, we would like to increase amounts, you know, that we're giving people um, school clothing. That's a very important program. So how are we helping our, our, our students on their journey of education? But I think there's more that we can be doing and our grants that we've gotten, um, STEP, NYCP, TEDNA ACE, these grants have allowed us to build capacity in the area of like, okay, our people aren't just handing out the check. That person is also the service. So they're practitioners and they're going into the school and they're tutors, they're mentors. Um, we're producing teachers. 
um, they're counselors unofficially, but we're sending people to serve in these roles that, hey, I am the service. I'm just as valuable as handing out the service. So we're also adding like this layer to what we do here in the Department of, Edu- of Education. That's why, you know, maybe sometimes you're not here to answer the phone because we're doing outreach or at a school or at a parent teacher conference. Um, we're meeting with superintendents. We're doing a number of things. And that education departments aren't just depending on what tribe they are. Um, for us, for example, we serve from birth to grave. So we're serving early childhood and our um, child care centers all the way to higher education. So that is a large amount of students and families that we serve. Um, and we have all these services that they have access to. But not every education department is like that. And I think that we are unique in that way. Um, but it also is a lot of work because... You think? <laughs> <laughs> because in my position, you have to be knowledgeable in early childhood. You have to be knowledgeable in pre-K through 12. You have to be knowledgeable in higher education, in addition to that administration. So when you step in and you have no... It's just like uh, you're learning on the job. And I'm very fortunate that... We have a lot of people here who have been here for a number of years before I came. People like Francine Williams knows her job. Like if you were to ask her about her budget, she would could tell you down to the penny how much money she has in her budget. Um, people who have been here for a long time who have helped me, Megan Hart. I mean, you know, it's a federal program, state program that can tell you every single policy guideline, I mean, protocol that they have to adhere to and that they educate me so that I can do my job. So thankful for them. Um, I love to read. I love to do research. So there's a number of things that where I look at other tribes, their programs, what they're doing. And I'm always asking questions. Well, how did you do that? How did you do that? Who showed you how to do that? Show me, tell me that person, because I want to know, because I think that we could always be doing more and making more progress. So. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm glad you put it that way, because I know that when I talked with the folks from higher ed, they said, you know, we... We yeah we want to give scholarships and stuff, but, but I brought the I brought up the uh, the fact that you know, I, I, and you know you, you may think that a high school graduation is not that big a deal in the whole scheme of things, but I'm like no 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 it is because you never maybe those kids maybe those kids parents didn't graduate from high school. Right, right. I like I said you know you have kids like you know I know that like me and myself and my cousins in our larger family we were like the first generation to ever attend college Mm -hmm. and get degrees. And I never, I said, oh, I didn't mean, you know, I didn't realize what a big deal that was Mm -hmm. to my family, my parents and and their, and my aunts and uncles. And uh, uh, the point was brought up that, you know, yeah, we can, we can't just, we're not, we don't want to just hand out scholarships checks when they graduate. Mm -hmm. We realize that, you know, if you don't know what uh, a FAFSA is Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you don't know all the, the terminology and the lingo, you you have to educate not the students, but also the parents. Right. And then you said birth to grave. Like, yeah, but JOM helps. Well, you know, maybe they need help with athletic gear, athletic mm-hmm. shoes. Uh, maybe it's band uniforms. Maybe it's eyeglasses so that they can do better in school. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, this, the, I, as you brought that up, and I, I've, you know, been here long enough, I learned some things. I'm like, yeah, we, this, I mean, I, I think the, the tribe, the tribe in itself has so many services. Mm-hmm. But man, when you talk about the education department, there's a large chunk of it right here. Mm, absolutely. We have, I think, an $8.4 million budget, and that includes gaming funds, state, federal um, program income that will we receive those funds. I think uh, I did a annual report this year, and 51% of our funds come from federal funds, So, um, which is nice, but... Also, they have special rules. That comes and regulations. with a whole lot of strings. Yes, it does vary a, a lot of strings. So it's nice to always have gaming money to supplement because with gaming, I feel that's where we are able to assert what's important to us, um, how we're giving out money, um, what services are needed, and we always, you know, are asking feedback from our families and our students. So that's another thing. Whenever we, you know, redid our strategic plan in twenty twenty. Um, you know, replacing the word parent with family because, you know, um, it may not be a parent raising that child and be a guardian. Yeah. And if or grandparent or aunt, uncle. So whenever we have, you know, parent nights, now it's family nights or 
if we are having a family night and we're offering food or incentives, it's bring the whole family. Like we're going to feed everybody. We're going to make sure everybody has an incentive so everybody feels welcome, even though we may be servicing one child of that family. But we want everybody to feel welcome and included. What uh, I, you said you've been here, what, five years now? Eight. Eight. I, I, oh yeah. Twenty fifteen. <laughs> How long have we been talking? No. <laughs> uh, I. What? Let me ask you this. So, the, what? What are we doing? And maybe I hope I think you can answer this. What are we doing now uh, that we weren't doing? that we weren't doing when you got here that you think has been streamlined or I'm not, you know, you don't oh. want to go pat myself on the no, shoulder. Look what I did. Never. But I know, I mean, I think things are, if it, I tell people, Hey, if you're, if we, it's like when you're riding a bicycle up a hill, if you're not pedaling, what happens? Right. You fall over or you worse, you start rolling backwards. Yes. You just got to keep pedaling, man. Right. You got to keep moving forward. And I know that's, you know, that's easy to say. That's yes. easier said than yes. done. But what would, what would you cut? What can you look at these, the time that you've been here and said, I think we do this better now. Yeah. I think we do it as a whole. I think we do a better job with this. Absolutely. And I think what we do now that we weren't doing before is that we're doing things collectively. Um, what I noticed when I came here was that, and I've done this before as a, as a program director, where you, are, you get very territorial. They're territorial over your program, over your staff, over your funding. So when I came here and we have 13 different programs, and all those programs also have different guidelines, right? We have federal money. We have state money. So we can only do this. We can only do that. Um, we Everyone was so soloed in their programs that— They're in what we call silos. Yes, silos. <laughs> yes, that's what it is, silos. That's I didn't the know, word I was looking for. The first time I heard you say that, I'm like, are we talking about a farm or no. what? I didn't, I didn't get it. Yeah, but it was very much like we're here doing our thing and leave us to be— so, and also I, I'm not old, but I'm also not young. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to start using that. I'm going to start using that. So, and I don't know what that means when you have someone younger than you trying to come in and tell you, hey, we should yeah, be doing yeah. this. We should be doing that way. So for, for a good number of years, you know, when I came, it was just learning, right? Learning how everybody was doing things and operating, learning different personalities, I'm um, learning what was important to them as programs and just listening, listening. And then also, you know, being able to be on this national organization where you're able to pull and see a big picture and look down and say, OK, what else, what could we be doing? So that really started, I would say, in 2019 of looking at, especially administration, looking at our budget and how what were we accomplishing with our budget and how we could how could we make progress if we had more money or we allocated money elsewhere so cuz you can't just ask for money no, people want to know what you're going to do with no. what you're going to do with you got to make do with what you have so yeah. i think our whole department does a great job at doing that making do with what we have um so Strategic plan, and I know you probably hate to hear this. <laughs> no, as, I love strategic plans. <laughs> as an administrator, Ask anybody. yeah. No, as, don't, don't do that. <laughs> as an administrator, and I was looking at how we were operating, like I said, they're we actually were, important. Yes, we were so individualistic, and I don't think that's that's not who we are, even as Indian people, right? We do everything as a family, or we do everything as a community, as a tribe. So. Why were we operating in that way? So when I was talking to consultants, friends that I had made, hey, how, where would I start? I didn't know how to do a strategic plan, but how do I start? How would I? This is my goal is that we as a department are working together collectively. She's like, OK, we took every single program's guidelines, um, objectives, goals, objectives, if they had some. Some programs didn't even have any. Um, we took all of those things, some programs made some up. So we were able to sit down and identify, you know, five different themes probably of like, okay, this is five goals we can identify as far as a department. Yeah, it's like it's, whether you guys knew it or not, you're doing working towards the same goal. Yes. Let me just point that out to you. <laughs> yes, and so whether it's goal one, then five programs are working toward that goal. And since then, since we've – you know, and I, I made several mistakes as a leader, too, of assuming everyone knew what a strategic plan was, assuming people understood their purpose, 
And so when I started throwing out strategic plan, hey, I need your feedback for that, I got zero feedback because everybody's <laughs> like, well, what is a strategic plan and why why is that important? So I had to take several steps back and say, okay, I shouldn't have hit him with all of that information. So um, I think this is at the end of COVID when everybody started coming back to work. I saw the need for professional development of saying, okay, let me sit here and do a short five-minute presentation about strategic plans and a purpose. Um, so that was my mistake, assuming people knew what I was talking about and knew what I wanted. So I knew I had to do a better job educating. You know, it's important for us to educate our families and students, but also my staff, our staff, our employees here, so they know yeah, what they're yeah. working toward. Um, so I started doing a better job at that, and then people started to understand and grasp, like, oh, this is it's not a scary thing. It's just very simple that here's goal one, and we're all working toward that in one way or another. And so what's also helped is that now we are collaborating on events activities or collaborating with funding, and it's no longer, well, this is my federal funding, and it says I can't do that, so we're not going to do that. No, everybody figures out a way to help. And I think that's also, you know, helping is, you know, a tribal value too, is like we're always figuring out how we can help people. Whether your program can't do that with federal funding, well, hold on, I've got gaming money. Let me see if I can make their requests work with this. So that's what I've seen change. You see people emailing one another um, without needing my approval to do that, collaborating on events and activities, talking to one another in the hallway. Um, hey, you're doing this. Can I help with this? Do you have money for this? I mean, I don't, I'm out of funding right now. And so having those conversations, like everybody, I think, feels comfortable having those conversations with one another. And I don't need to be in the room to do that. But I, I can see that change, that dynamic, that shift since I've been here. And that makes me really happy because if that's what we're doing here and that's what we're prioritizing, then it's only going to be beneficial to the families and students that we serve. So if I can't help you, I mean, let me ask one of my other directors what, how they can help you and we'll figure it out. Um, so I think that's where it's been changed, where now we're doing this collectively um, as opposed to maybe, yeah, child care, maybe they see them from zero to 12 years of age. Well, also, they're going to eventually filter into JOM. They're going to filter into school clothing. And maybe they might filter into higher education. So there's all these programs where we're, we're servicing the same families and students. It's not just siloed into that one program there's at that, that one word. time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I think that everybody has done an excellent job once where I've been able to explain why we're doing this, why this is important, and hopefully they've bought into that. So. Uh, here's the time for a pop quiz. Uh, you started. Can do you think? I don't. I don't. I don't hate to put you on the spot. Okay. Can you think you can re- give me a rundown of what programs we have here at the, at the department? Yes. Um, Head Start, and of course we have three Head Starts: Concho, Clinton, Canton, Child Care. We have Concho and Clinton. We have school clothing. We have academic ec- excellence and enrichment. We have higher education. We have JOM. We have Shiner Apple Productions. We have um, step step grant. We have the Shiner Apple Youth Council. We have administration. Yeah, that's it. Hawk, were you writing that down? Were you keeping score? Because <laughs> I wasn't. I think you hit it. I think you yeah, hit it. Yeah, I think so. That's a lot. And you know, I, I I'm I'm sure that there are some people who said, well, well, how come we don't have this, this, and this? I'm like, some tribes don't even have half of that. No, yes. And I, you Absolutely. know, I'm not. You know, it's just it's we're all we're all in a different spot. Mm-hmm. You know, we're all a different spot in line. Right. Um, I, oh, you know, so <clears throat> you mentioned, um, I think a couple, at least one of those is new. What did, what did you call it? Ac- what did oh, you call AEE. it? A, which stands for? Academic Excellence and Enrichment. Yeah, that's fairly new. Can you yes. talk about that? So the whole purpose of creating that program was that we knew, I think it was in 20, 2021, we knew that in 2023, NYCP grant would end. The Native Youth Community yes, project. project grant. That's a grant from Office of Indian Education. So that was a five-year grant um, intervention program at Clinton Public Schools. They serve third through eighth grade. Um, and we had that grant for a number of years. Five years, yes. And they they got a one-year extension because of COVID year. When everybody was sent home, they came back. And so we had 
extra money. And so we were allowed to, it was originally four year grant, but it went to five years. So that, that program, AEE, um, we knew that the work that NYCP doing was impactful and it was making progress there for the families and students um, in Clinton Public School District. And I'll also back up and say that when I worked at the RESPECT program, um, you know, we were always trying to get into schools to just say, like, here's some pizza, here's all of our applications, here's what we have coming up. Um, And I would say maybe three schools would let us come in and do that. And we also wanted to say we just need China Rappo students. Clinton was one of those schools that would never let us in the doors. So it was, well, if you want to address those students, you have to address all of our students. So we would just say, okay, every year we would try. So when I got here, we had working relationships with three public school districts. And here in Western Oklahoma, our service area includes 13 public school districts. So in 2015, we had okay working relationships with three, and that was because of a grant. They were written into a grant, and they partnered with us. Um, Since then, we have positive, meaningful working relationships with 10 of those public school districts that are, you know, I just got off the phone with the superintendent about an issue with the student and family, and we talked for about 30 minutes. Um, I've gotten to the point where I am texting superintendents, assistant principals, hey, there's this issue, what do you know about it? Um, We're calling each other, Um, and those superintendents are really the people that dictate whether we have a relationship or not. And Clinton, they have an excellent, you know, superintendent, and I think it's kind of like those older white guys (laughs) that are retiring out. The old guard moves out. You know, they got to get new blood in. Getting in new blood. Um, ceiling. That's how things happen. Yeah. I, I mean, let's just be honest. Yes. I mean, there are certain Absolutely. things it makes uh, a, it that, makes that, a difference. that we could not have done 10 years ago. Right. In um, 2015, we were at a school district, district that said, we don't need your help. Our students are fine. Okay. 2023, I just got off the phone with the new superintendent that's there because that superintendent prior retired. They have somebody new. Um, so they absolutely dictate if they that school district has a relationship with the tribes. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> I, I was getting we, oh, I did, yeah, like uh, this big circle. Um, uh, I um, don't know. I I, oh. I got really. Oh, you went. You were going to. Uh, oh, and AEE and MICP. Thank you, thank so, you for bringing what, us back. What's significant about Clinton Public Schools? So you add in consistency on the tribe part of you know tribes part of saying okay, we're going to have the same executive director to send out there over and over again. Now, what also plays a critical role was tribal consultation. So tribal consultation started in 2016, 2017, um, where if you receive $40,000 of Title VI funds or you have, you know, 50, 50% of your popula- population is Native American, you are required, that school, school district is required to have a tribal consultation. As to how they spend that money. As to how they spend that money, Title VI funding, making sure they're spending it correctly. They have to show you how much they receive how they're spending it. And so, do we agree? And do does yes, the, the parents tribe. agree with yes. how you spend that money? So that was very impactful. In that first year of tribal consultations, it was it's brand new practice to everybody mm-hmm. across the nation. And so it was just very, you know, formal and okay. We didn't really know what questions to ask. Um, our step grant at the time, you know, they helped to build a guidebook to kind of show states um, show LEAs and TEAs as far as like this is what could happen at a tribal consultation. LEAs, local education Thank agency, you. and that's a school district. TEA is tribal education agency, which is us. SEA is state, state education agency, which is the state department. So there was just all of these things happening all at once. So once the tribal consultations and Clinton was required to have one with us. So first year was very... Okay. Let's just say that required. Yes. <laughs> required because it was just nobody knew how to act. And the superintendent's principals were like, okay, am I going to get in trouble? Um, there's just so much distrust between, you know, the tribes and the public school district. So by year two, it was, you know, it was a lot better. So we, now we were having meaningful conversation of what could you be doing with this money? Um, we were applying for a new grant. 
And we usually reach out to different school districts where we didn't have any partnerships really out in Western Oklahoma. So I think we reached out to Hammond and Clinton to say, hey, would you want to partner with us on this grant? Hammond said yes, but they didn't get it signed by their school board in time. Clinton did. So we just concentrated our whole effort with that grant in Clinton Public School Districts. Now what's what's happened since is that they have not now utilized their Title VI funding where they were using it to pay the light bill. Exactly. Or pay, that those, th- that, um, those are not just stories. That's yes, real. Yes, it's that very happens. real. Um, pay, you know. Or that used to happen. Yeah, it's, different teachers or whatever they just thought that the needed to, money needed to be. Now all that money is directed to their Title VI Indian Education Coordinator, um, whatever, you know, incentives or what they're doing for our Native students out there. So... Um, positive, great working relationship with the tribes. I mean, it. I wish people could see and really understand how how much that has changed because it and and you know for me to be here and to see that in real time and it it didn't happen overnight. That's the oh thing. no. <laughs> so it's you know like I said, it doesn't the, happen by no, it doesn't. It's not easy. No, and this the distrust and so building trust on both parts. And then, you know, we, I I would say that relationship has made a complete, you know, completely change. And that's because of a grant. That's because of tribal consultations. Now their money money is being spent the way that's needed to be spent. Um, They have a Title VI uh, parent committee. I mean, everything, and they're making sure they're adhering to all those rules and those guidelines where before that wasn't happening. I know a little, and it's, I, the great thing is I know a little bit about what you're talking about because yes. uh, my my kids both graduated from Moore High School, mm-hmm. and I was involved in the, the Indian Education mm-hmm. uh, Parent Committee there with the JOM, and like so that it at one point it was Title Title Seven, seven. then when, at one point wasn't it Title One? I don't Four. know. I, but anyway, yeah. the, 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 as, as I understand it, the, the Title Six money that's federal money that comes in, yes, and. The thing is, as I understand it, if I if I tell me if I'm right or wrong, they can spend that money on anything they want as long as the parent committee signs off yes. on it. Yes. And but there are there are and there, there are not made up stories. Mm-hmm. Some schools, because there was not proper consultation, right? They were spending it on, you know, to pay the electric bill, yes. to pay the water bill, stuff like that. And I'm like, that that's not that's well. Then so not also, right. there, I've heard the rationale. Well, we keep the lights on for. Yeah, for everybody. for everybody. <laughs> or, or we contacted parents, but no one showed up. Well, yes. there's a difference between uh, using uh, social media mm-hmm. and email mm-hmm. and posting. There's a difference between that and posting a a a posting a eight by ten on the door yes. of the schools. That's not right. getting the word out. Right. So uh, and then, uh, but but since we're here, uh, J O M mm-hmm. money. Uh, and they, they, they're when you, when you, at least in my experience, I, when I was, you, we had JOM slash Title Seven meetings, mm-hmm. and I had to differentiate. Could you? Well, the two very different. Yeah, exactly. So we're sources. while we're here, can you talk about that? Yeah. So JOM is Department of Johnson Interior. O'Malley. Yes, Johnson Johnson O'Malley. Federal Depart- Federal program. Federal, pro- federal program. Um, Title Six comes from the Office of Indian Education, Department of Education. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities as far as, um, you know, prioritizing language and culture, activities, things like that, tutoring, dropout prevention. There's similar similarities in that. However, JOM, um, they're, who qualifies for JOM and how you qualify it's is different. very different. So that's on the responsibility of like the parent and JOM, depending if – the tribe is receiving the money or the school district's receiving the money. Title VI is the school receives the money. Then the school's responsible for getting that form filled out by, you know, the family or parent or guardian or whoever. And then I think for Title VI, you have to be an enrolled uh, tribal member of a tribe. JOM, I believe they can accept ascendancy. For I think you're right. So two very different, and I know a lot of people get those things mixed up. Ex- but well, exactly. As, as I as I first got involved yes. some years ago, it took me a long time to figure that out. And I'm as I'm here, since as I work in this building now, mm-hmm. I'm like, 
oh, I think I know how it works now. It's like, yes. And it's like, once I hit that, I'm like, hey, I actually know something. Yeah. And so when we talk about it, I, I feel so much better that I can actually kind of see where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. So, and then it's, people just assume too that it's just Indian money, right? And <laughs> how do we get those services to us? So then we also have to educate those families of like, oh, wait, you're you're not eligible here, but you're eligible here. Exactly. Or you're not, no, you didn't fill, that's not the J-O-M form. That's the title. You got to fill out this. So it gets, I understand on the family's part, it gets overwhelming. Having it can to be, absolutely. Fill out all these forms, check the right boxes, um, and it gets mixed up with school clothing and, you know, <laughs> it, it's a mess at the beginning of the school year. And throw, so. in fa- throw in FAFSA, too. Yes, yeah, throw that in, too. And <laughs> hey, that just real makes quickly, it better. I'm going to quiz another quiz. What, is it, what does FAFSA stand for? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Financial aid? No, it, it's free. Oh, okay. It's free application for, is it for financial student aid? I, I don't I, know. I, we were talking about that just today anyway. That that's an, that wow. we, we'll 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 edit that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I felt that way. I got to ask you, Carrie. Uh, you know, I know that you worked in, in respect or before you came here, which stands for let's see, recreation, exercise, and sports for the elders and children of our tribes. Yes, also good for you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So, I, when in getting here, uh, it, it's a different, it's a whole different world. Yes, but. I know now you are still on your education journey. You're working on your PhD. Yes. Uh, and I can, so I know you attended Haskell. Mm-hmm. You graduated from Haskell. And so how, tell me how this whole being here has changed your, your uh, educational, your educational journey. Okay. So I went to Darlington. Well, I went to Contra Head Start to begin with. Um, and this old building right next to Oh, us. no kidding. <laughs> yes. No kidding. Years ago, there used to be a playground out here. It's so. an old building over there. Over there. <laughs> so I went to there. I went to Darlington, went to Calumet, went to Haskell School um, as an undergraduate, went to OU for my master's, and then at Kansas State now for my PhD. So I'll say that, and I've written about this before, and, you know, I've been fortunate that I have had grandparents who helped raise me and my mother. Um, and they always prioritized, you know, my grandpa was an Arapaho chief, you know, so from a young age, I knew that, you know, we were different in a way that not everybody goes to ceremonies, not everybody goes to powwows, not everybody goes to NAC meetings. Um, but I was fortunate that I learned from a very young age, watching my grandma and grandpa and my mom, um, my uncles learning what it, you know, means to be, you know, uh, Arapaho woman or young woman person. Um, you know, and I share this anytime I speak is that they always, always teach me, you know, tell me. Always remember who you are and where you come from. And as a kid, when you think you know everything, you're just like, oh, okay. You know, yeah, I know. Um, And it wasn't until later in life where I realized that um, I wasn't proud of those things because I was in a school system that where you were – Mm, um, pre- you're preaching now. Yeah, you're preaching now. You're, you're different um, because of maybe the way that you live your life. And so I didn't realize this till much later. Years later, um, when I was in like, you know, all white friends and all white school, all white teachers, all white curriculum, which is still prevalent today. Um, I never asserted myself as an Arapaho person. Shine Arapaho person. And you're not just, certainly not alone in that. Yes. And I would just kind of, okay, let's not mention that thing. But let me, I want to be like all my friends, right? So I would dress the way that they dress. I would highlight my hair the way that they blonde, you know, and I'm brown. <laughs> I don't know why I would do that. I would have green contacts, blue contacts, um, because I wanted to be anything but myself of who I was, who I was taught to be. At a young age. So um, 
I didn't really realize that's what was happening to me. So once I left, graduated high school, um, and then also you add in that layer of being an athlete and being made fun of and being called names, and you're like, well, I want to be anything but Indian, you know? I don't want people making fun of me and calling me these names, and I'm trying to play basketball, and they're making these motions and this the stands, you know? Um, and you always think, like, are they doing that because – I'm different or because I'm Indian, then you think like as an adult, yeah, they're doing that. (laughs) Um, But you don't, you don't really realize that. Anyway, so once I graduated high school, I didn't realize that's what I was doing. Um, I went to Haskell Indian Nations University, which is a tribal college and university. One, I went there because, you know, my mom graduated with her associate's degree. Um, My grandparents always told me like, hey, you've got to go to college. You need to go to college. You should go to college. Um, I had other former teachers telling me that. So, um, and then also we don't have, you know, college trust funds sitting aside hey. for us to hey, say, here, you, you take don't all have this $20,000 yeah, in your back no. pocket like the rest of us? Or here, go take out a $20,000 loan and become hey. in debt and go, Ooh. you know. Now you're really preaching. Yeah. Hey. So I didn't have, I didn't know what a loan was. I didn't, yeah. we didn't have the money. I was, you know, from a single parent household. Um, so I didn't really understand that, you know, the, the historical, you know, background of Haskell at the time and why essentially it was a free university. Um, I went there because one, um, I was 18. I thought I knew everything and I wanted to go away from home Two, I played basketball in high school of basketball and I wanted to go play basketball in college. So, um, chose to go there and it wasn't until I got there and looked around and really realized like the space I was stepping into where it was like, I can be myself here. Wow. Everyone here is Indian. <laughs> yeah. And not, There's a bunch of Indians yes, here. And not only that, <laughs> they're intelligent. Yeah. They're motivated. They're smart. They they like being Indian. Yes. And they proud of who they were. <laughs> and so it was like, oh, okay, it's safe to talk about my family. It's safe to talk about, you know, my, what I experienced growing up and that, oh, you've experienced that too. Okay. Yeah. Me too. Um, you have three generations (laughs) living in your household. Oh yeah. So do we, (laughs) uh, so being able to share those things and feel comfortable, um, and being motivated by people, you know, other students, you know, I I'm had, sure that changed your whole your yeah, whole outlook. Absolutely. Um, you know, I had people. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm majoring in elementary education. I'm gonna be a teacher. I'm gonna go back to a reservation and be the teacher there. I'm majoring in business because I want to go work at the casino at our tribe. I mean, I had never occurred to me to do that because in my mind, because when I was in high school, it was the tribe being Indian that was down here you know you just didn't do those things those weren't things you looked forward to you weren't proud of those things um because we were essentially in a system that told us like this oh. is what's superior <laughs> and, we're gonna you know, have to pass the plate in a okay. minute because carrie's preaching <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so i never thought like oh why, why would i would never go work at the tribe that's beneath me and i just had this attitude of i'm too good for that so once i went to high school and just thought like well, why, why wouldn't I want to work at my tribe? Why wouldn't I want to go and help, you know, make some progress or do good things? Um, so it wasn't until I went to high school and I, that really was instilled in me of relearning all those things I've been taught all my life. And so once I graduated from high school, I came home and it took me about a year to find permanent employment. And so that was with the RESPECT program in 2006. And I've been here ever since and so I think the one thing that the respect program because that was when it first started that's Mm -hmm. when I was first hired was we just hit the ground running and I mean building that program building all of the services that they offer events activities applications um really learning you know the mission and that program is really built by community people community leaders Um, And I was just very thankful that they brought me in as like this, you know, like this kid, I feel like still. (laughs) And they were, you know, they knew a lot more than I knew at the time. So really guiding me. And um, that's really a community-based program where they saw this need 
And they were like, hey, we should have a program to fit that need. Um, providing opportunity, you know, to our kids. Now that I'm in this world, I have a daughter that's in like competitive athletics. You know, we have so many native kids that are great athletes in various sports, but you know, money talks in the in that area. You have to have the money to, you know, be on an AAU team, to be able to travel, to um, buy all the equipment that's needed. So really that's where respect kind of try to fill that gap of like, we have so many amazing student athletes, let's give them the money to be able to have that same opportunity that all these non-native kids get. Um, so, but the one thing that I learned there is because we worked with youth, we worked with adults, we worked with elders, um, was how to build relationships and the importance of building relationships. Um, and that's just talking to people, learning how to talk to people from Hammond, from Sealing, uh, from Thomas, um, from Canton, learning who their families were. I knew the grandparent, I knew the parent, I knew the grandkids. Um, so learning all of those, you know, how you talk to people, how how you're related to everybody, you know, and that's what I think was I, what I was able to carry over from that program to over here is, okay, I know how to build relationships. And that leads you into building partnerships with people at different organizations. And so I'm really thankful that all of those things that I've done have really led me to here. Um, the other part of being a student, um, a full-time doctoral student, <laughs> I don't know if I look tired, but I'm tired. <laughs> she says, I'm tired on the inside. <laughs> you can't see, but I'm tired yeah. inside. Um, so I've been going full-time since 2020. Um, I'm in my fourth year of studies. i am completed coursework. I'm in the process of writing my proposal. So once I write my proposal, which is three chapters of my dissertation, I propose that my committee has to approve it. Then you move forward, com- complete your research, finish the dissertation, and then you can graduate. So I'm at, I'm done with all the coursework. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. That all sounds really scary to me. <laughs> it is scary. And for a long time, I didn't do it because I didn't think I was smart enough. Yeah. And I told uh, my cousin, y'all know who Natalie Youngbull is. Um, we went from kindergarten to high school to school together. You know, she's a professor at OU. And I was telling her, like, I would really like to do a Ph.D., but I don't, I don't think I'm smart enough to do that. She's like, <laughs> it's not about being smart. No, it's about being She's like committed, uh, yeah. I suppose. Do you have discipline? Do you yeah. Are you committed? Um, and if you're not committed, you should be. <laughs> yes. But two things I've always enjoyed. I've always enjoyed reading. I've always enjoyed <clears throat> writing and doing research. Well, tell me, uh, and I know, I, I, like I said, a lot of what you're talking about is, I feel like it's going right over my head. <laughs> but but I, I, you, you, tell me about uh, your final, uh, your thesis, and and because I, I know you, I, I know a little bit of what you're you're talking about, and kind of why why you're going that route, why you thought that's important. Well, I don't know at this point. No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just I read it in a yeah. magazine. Um, but no, you you you. I mean, uh, you you talk a lot, and and I. I'm I'm going to talk above my head. Is here. I heard the, I hear the word. Is it is it pedagogy? Pedagogy. Pedagogy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, see, there's, if there's no pedagogy, I don't want to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I, I but exp- we do explain what that is, and I get that's kind of what we're t- what you're talking about, right? Um, well, I think pedagogy is the education of. I want to say, I can't even remember. Um, well, uh, okay. In simplest terms, I think the way I've heard it explained is, um, you know what? Let me just say, I'm, first of all, I'm glad that you. I'm glad that you told us this this whole journey. Mm-hmm. You know, because I, I, I was speaking. We, matter of fact, we were at a cultural event. Mm-hmm. Um, where was it? And I was speaking with a teacher, mm-hmm. a teacher who I interviewed some 10, 11, 12 years ago. Uh-huh. Oh my gosh, I forget what. I can't even remember now. It's been a few weeks. And we were we were talking about, she said, you know, she teaches elementary, and she said, you know, I see such promise in these kids when they're at a young age, but when I see them sometimes in high school, I'm like, what what happened to that spark? Where is that, that light gone in, in their eye? And, you know, why they had such, and, 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 and I told her, I said, you know what I think? I, and, I, and I've 
said this for years. I, as an you know, as an adult, mm-hmm. I see it when we do these things. <clears throat> these when we go visit schools, and mm-hmm. I said, you know, every child, I believe, they have that spark. They have that wonder, that 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 light inside their eyes, and you can it's it's you can. You, it's visible. It's just mm-hmm. on display. You know, kids are curious and they ask you stuff and they're not scared of anything. Right. But somewhere down the line, man, this, I'm going to start preaching now. Somewhere down the line, this colonized colonial system, this colonized yeah. school system that we had, that sucks all the joy yeah. and the creativity out of those kids. And it makes them want to fit in like every, like robots, like just what you were talking about, mm-hmm. where we suck the creativity and the uniqueness out of those kids mm-hmm. where they all want to be like everybody else. They all want to, if everybody's wearing baggy pants, they want, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. They all want to, they want to look alike. And I, look, I get it. We were all, we've all been there. Mm-hmm. You do want to fit in. You don't want to be an outcast. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you've got to be yourself. Yes. And you've got to listen to the kind of music you like. You've got to uh, read the kind of books you like. Mm-hmm. And you've got to, you've got to have your own opinions. Right. And you can't be swayed by the majority and but the way this school system works, right. the way the 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 the, the, the colonized yes. school system works, it, it it so it tries to suck all that out of them. And so I I told these kids we were we were talking to some fifth graders or mm-hmm. third graders or whatever they were a few weeks ago at some school. I told them, don't let this school system steal your joy. Mm-hmm. I said because I was talking about uh, our uh, the work we here do here at um. Shannon Radville Productions. Mm-hmm. I was talking about Adam Young Bear's animation. Mm-hmm. I said, "How many of you guys draw?" They all almost all raised their mm-hmm. hand. I said, "I said I, I used to as well. I don't anymore. I don't know why I don't. When my children were young, I did. Right. And I said, I know so many people who used to draw all the time. By the time they're in high school, they don't do it anymore because I think they got embarrassed about it. Mm-hmm. And I think, but I said the, the great thing about people who have jobs like Adam." You, you, it's it's not childish. It's mm-hmm. childlike. Yes. You still have, and I still have it too. And it, what we do, the the creative stuff we do here, you have to have that childlike wonder and curiosity. Man, I couldn't be. I, I mean, this is the perfect job for me because I get to be creative all yes. the time. And yeah. uh, but I think you know, you still sometimes see that in in high school. But man, by and large. Mm-hmm. It's gone, and they they we we do we try to stick them in these little you know. Uh, these little little silos, yeah. <laughs> mini silos, that where they we we make them. You know, here's what here's you do this, then you go graduate, then you go to college, then you get a job doing this, mm-hmm. and just but like, also those standards. Who are those standards set by? Exactly. Like so, that's what we're supposed to do. Determined by who? That wasn't determined by us. Now we're getting now right. we're no, now it's getting real. Yeah. So I think that's well, what that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Right? So let me also say, like, I am not an expert of like pre K through twelve, even early childhood. That is not my interest, or or, or <laughs> you know. So like my master's degree and my PhD degree is adult learning, adult learners. That's where I learn more about, and I work with adult learners much more. Um, adult but adults who may have been through have yes. been through that colonialized, yes. so, that colonized, yes. however you want to say it, school Absolutely. system. Absolutely. So, um, I so there's a book. I don't know if you know Dr. Cornell Cornell P. Rewardy. Yeah. Um, he wrote this book, or he edited this book, and um, he's the editor of this book called Set Unsettling Settler Colonial Education. So that's Western education, settler colonial colonial education, European education, how it's referred to. Um, colonize, colonization, <laughs> all of those things. So um, anyways, he has this book um, and he has this conceptual framework where he talks about um, becoming conscious of how you are upholding seller colonial e- education and you may not even be aware you're Absol- doing that. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. how do you transform out of that? And he provides mm. these steps of how you transform, you become self-aware, you become critical of your experiences, of how you think, what you say, what you do, um, and really trying to get people to recenter on, you know, their their people, their community, their family, uh, what's important to us there, and how are we upholding, like, our own standards, our own values, right? We, we've learned those from, from a young age, if you were fortunate Ideally, to. you learn yes. those from your family, not from school. Yes. And so, <laughs> um, anyways, in that book— 
Um, I wrote a chapter in that book, and I think Deidre has a copy down the hallway. But I, my, my book is called, uh, my chapter is called Intergenerational Lessons from Shiner Abaho Women. So I talk about my grandmother and I talk about my mother um, and myself. So I talk about how education has connected us um, through, three, through three generations and really within a five mile, mile radius. So my grandmother um, and my grandpa, they worked at Riverside Indian School. They transferred to this here to Concho. When, when the old... Uh, Indian school. Yeah, right behind so us, actually. This building, too. Yeah, this, this was, building. Um, the old Indian school. And so just the block over, um, that's where my grandparents lived and my mother and her siblings were raised. So my grandmother, um, she went to boarding school. Um, and I think that was at the time where it wasn't... You weren't having the best experiences. And my mother said... My grandma would always say, I'm not sending my kids to boarding school. And that was that. She never provided stories. She never provided context or why she would say that. She just said, you guys are never going to boarding school. And so my grandmother, when my grandpa and they, they lived out here. So my grandpa worked as a coach here at the Indian school. My grandmother was a dorm matron. So that's when the kids lived here in the dorm. She helped out, um, kind of helped raise the students out here. And then she turned into being a student aide. And so at the time, my mom, so since they worked here at the school, my mom and her siblings weren't allowed to attend the Indian school. So they had to be bused into El Reno and they attended um, Sacred Heart because we were they were Catholic at the time. So they went to Sacred Heart. Um, and my mom says that once they aged out of Sacred Heart, I think at sixth grade, they had to attend a public school, which is in seventh grade, El Reno. And she just, you know, once her siblings, they started filtering into the public school district, it was just like there was no opportunity there for Indian students. Um, we weren't, they weren't given a fair shot. And so at the time it was like Riverside, Shalako, Fort Sill, boarding schools. However, at that time they were, you know, it was the BIE at the time that were overseeing those schools. So my mom said, you know, she had asked her parents, can I go to Fort Sill? I have cousins, I have friends that's going there. And they're like, no, why would we send you there? And you can go to El Reno. But she's like, no, they make fun of us. They tease us on the bus. They make fun of us. They say, did you bring your tomahawk chop today? Or make fun of them for being Indian. You know, my mom loved to play softball. She would never even get the opportunity to play. My uncles played football. They wouldn't let them play. Um, so it was like, we need, we, we don't have anything to do here. There's nothing to do here. So all of my, my mom and her siblings, they all went to different Indian schools. My mom went to Fort Sill. So my grandma, you know, worked out here for a number of years. She retired. They moved to El Reno. My mom, so then she went to high school. This is another interesting thing. So my grandma went to high school, high school when it was a vocational school. My mom went there when it was a junior college, and I went there when it was a university. And you can go back into the Indian leader and find all of our pictures. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, so... Um, you know, years later, my mom, she, uh, had sent my sister to Darlington when she was like in second grade, I think. And, um, you know, she worked out here at the Head Start program and she would just drop her off at the time. There wasn't a lot of Indian students that went to school there. Then we all went to school there. And so Mr. Merriweather at the time had seen her like, Hey, she gets her kids here on time. She, you know, they, you know, they look like, they're taken care of, you know, and so they were looking for a tutor, a student aide um, at the time. And he had asked my mom, hey, do you want to, you know, work here? And so she started working there when I was in first grade as a, um, I think, a student aide. And, oh, no, teacher aide, student aide, teacher aide. Um, and so she started working there and she's been there ever since. So, you know. Got her own building over there yeah, almost. Got a name now. on a building so over she's there. there. I'm much older now but she's still there so when I think about my mom and what she's doing there her commitment to you know native students or education my grandmother what she's done here when she worked at Concho and really her purpose of you know I this is what I experience I'm gonna make sure no you know no nobody else has that experience being in a boarding school and then I think about myself now where I'm in ed Indian education obviously are you know who I mean our job titles are different. Our duties are different. But what keeps us connected really is our responsibility and our commitment to Native students and families 
and that, you know, that's three generations and not ever intentionally me not going into education thinking that, but this is where I wound up. And I get to come to a building where my grandma used to come to work every day. I mean, how special is that? And so in that chapter, that's what I talk about. And I talk about the lessons that they taught me um, as a little girl, like my grandma. I'm the youngest of three, and I was like the rugged one. I was the one that was always in trouble, always <laughs> getting into so fights. So were we recording on that? <laughs> okay. I would make my brother and sister cry. I would always getting into something. And for a long time, I thought like, dang, my grandma doesn't love me. Because I, she's always getting on to me. She, I'm always in trouble with her. But what she was doing is like, hey, you need to sit down and behave. You need to listen. You need to pay attention. You need to watch. You need a hamster. Yeah, you watch what we're <laughs> doing. Listen. You know, behave. Sit down. And I would always be trying to run everywhere. And she'd drag me back. Whether it was a powwow, NAC meeting, be quiet. You know, and you think about... As a Native people and how we learn, that's how we learn, right? We're not learning from books. She was trying to get me to sit down and pay attention to what she was doing, what my grandpa was doing. Um, and I think about that, like, that's a lesson, you know. Does everybody have that in their lives, their grandma, to, like, get on to them? They make should. Make them beha- behave <laughs> and listen. And I think about that now when I'm sitting in a meeting. Like, I know how to sit here and listen to you and behave and pay attention um, because of my grandma. My mom... When I was at Darlington, um, she really taught me a valuable lesson because I, like I said, I was rowdy. um, And I got in a fight one day with a boy at school. And, um, you know, I wasn't worried about getting in trouble from the principal. And that was fine. But if my mom knew, and you know, then I knew I knew I was going to get in trouble. So we get into a fight. The boy goes and tells the teacher. I get in trouble. And I'm sitting there thinking in class, Okay, as long as my mom doesn't know, you know, I'm good. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there thinking like, okay, the day is going to go on. Um, have our week at that knock on the door, you know, she works there and she pulls me out and she gives me heck. And, you know, she back then you could beat your kids up and that's what she did to me, <laughs> you know. We're going to edit that part out yeah, too. Okay, no, we so, won't. No. <laughs> um, but she said, and I think about this now, she's like, you can't fight kids like do you understand I work for white people and I didn't understand what she's talking about but she's based on her experience you know of being in the system working with white people myself if I'm acting who am I representing I'm representing Mm. her my Mm. family Mm. you know all okay all Indian kids are like to fight they're all rugged that's how it works yeah whether we like it or not and so realizing oh you know of course I, you know, I got in trouble, but now as an adult, a professional of what she was trying to teach me that, you know, you, you have to be mindful of what you say, what you do, how you react, um, because we don't have the privilege as Indian students, Indian people to do or react however, however we like, right? If somebody provokes me, I should have had enough restraint to just leave that alone, um, That's a hard lesson right yeah, there, right. even as an adult. Yes. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, and really that that chapter and just reflecting on what my mother has taught me, um, what my grandma's taught me from a young age, and those lessons of what they taught me is why I feel why I'm in the position that I'm in today. Um, what they taught me, not what public school, you know, white, European, Western education has taught me, or put me to be in this, you know, because um, at the center of who I am and what I do is everything that they've taught me, everything that they've shown me. Um, but that's what I talk about in that chapter of that book and um, being able to reflect like that like that, and write it down um, is really, you know, as I was doing it, it made me cry because, you know, you think about what what they, they want for you and what they want for your life. Um, and what they're trying to prepare you for. And, you know, as a kid, you don't know. Um, but I think that, you know, what's kept us connected is just our responsibility to our communities, to our students and families. And, you know, we want we want better opportunity. We want them to have a fair shot. We want them to have better experiences in these public school systems that we have to go to. You know what I think, Carrie? What? 
I think you're in the absolute right spot. <laughs> and with that, we will wrap up this okay. episode. Thank oh, you so much for being here, Carrie. And thank you guys for joining us here. We will uh, see you and hear from you next time on another episode of the Shine on Rapo Productions podcast. See you later. <laughs>